Come, let us sing for the joy of the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God.
worship together this morning, I invite you to stand. This is our, yes, now, uh, this is our theme scripture for this week of Vacation Bible School. All the decorations, all the, the finery that you see around the building points to a reality that we are God's workmanship. God is at work in us to do great things. So let's say this together this morning. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Ephesians 2.10. Now, while the band is playing the introduction, you welcome those who are seated there close to you this morning. Tell them you're glad to see them in church.
you this morning to, to join us around this altar as we come to pray. His love is marvelous, wonderful.
Father, I am so thankful that you allow us the privilege to be able to gather together on a Sunday morning to sing to you, to bow before you in prayer, to worship you with everything that we've got, with everything that we are. Father, we need that. I don't know what there is about this season of the year, but these events and experiences seem to be concentrated, those kind like a, a graduation, whether it's kindergarten, first grade, eighth grade, or high school or college. We reflect on those moments and think, whew, my life will never be the same. This is a season when a lot of our students are beginning to drive. They've gotten their driver's licenses in the last little while and they're out on the roads, loose, free. And there are those folks who have raised them who think, whew, our lives will never be the same. They're graduating and sometimes they're moving out and we're experiencing an empty nest and we say, whew, our life will never be the same. They're getting married and they look at each other at the altar and they say, whew, our lives will never be the same. And even for our elderly, I think about that 97 year old who packed up all of her worldly possessions last week and moved to a new phase of life, to a new address. And she could rightfully say, whew, my life will never be the same. Well, that's true for all of us. They're just those milestones, Father, that remind us. And, and at those times, in those moments, rather than burying ourselves in our belly buttons and feeling sorry for ourselves because life is never gonna be the same, Father, we have an opportunity to, to look up and to look to you because you knew this was coming. You knew we were gonna be here today and you knew the circumstances that would surround our individual lives and our collective experience. And so, Father, I pray that more than wallowing in our uncertainty and despair that we would in faith look to you rather than fearing the unknown of the future father that we would in confidence look to you and hold on to you and allow you to be our guide rather than bemoaning our fate father i pray that we would confidently and joyfully embrace the life that you are affording to us at this moment oh we want to learn from where we've been we want to be wiser because we've been through it Yes, Father, but we want to be ready for this, for this day, for this moment. So help us. Help us to trust you and to follow you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Stand together. As we worship, we celebrate, we remember the faithfulness of our Father.
worship together. Thank you for that good singing this morning. If you were here last Sunday and you looked at your bulletin and remember it and you don't, this is the sermon title that was there. Yes, uh, I had it prepared for last weekend, which would have been Memorial Day weekend, and I have slightly remodeled it and you're going to get it this morning because I'm not going to waste a good sermon preparation, okay? And I think it, it fits as well today as it, as it would have last Sunday morning. I've made the comment more than once, and I do say it with great conviction. I think every American citizen ought to be required at some point in their early life to make a trip to Washington, D.C. It is an incredibly beautiful place. It is filled with impressive buildings. The architecture is incredible. There are monuments. There are memorials. There is a story there that we need to be reminded of along the way. About 35, six, seven years ago, and I don't remember exactly, I, I remember that the girls were both young and were in strollers. Cindy and I took the opportunity to make our way up the East Coast. Our ultimate destination was Buffalo, New York, because that's where grandparents lived. I'd never met them, and it would prove to be my only time to ever meet them. But along the way, we were going to stop at some of these highlights that we'd read about in our history books in places in the country that we'd never been to. And we stopped along the way, camping along the way, and we made ourselves our, our way to, to a campsite just outside Washington, D.C., and we gave ourselves a day and a half to tour Washington, D.C. So we put on our walking shoes. I look at the pictures, and it's a little embarrassing. Uh, to I, I wouldn't show you the pictures because men's short styles were considerably shorter back in that day than they are today. Whew, it's coming back. But I'm telling you, there was a lot of leg for me in those pictures. But we, we carted up the two kids, and we took off intent on seeing as much as we could possibly see. We went through every building of the Smithsonian. And, and we, we saw most of what was in that, those buildings, not for very long, mind you, but we, we saw them. We made our way to the Lincoln Memorial and looked out over the waiting pool. We made our way to the Washington Monument and stared up at it. And, and finally, we made our way to the memorial that I was least excited about, but proved to be the most impactful. We found our way to the Vietnam War Memorial push the girls down in front of it. From a distance, it is striking. Just architecturally, it's an impressive edifice. But we got down closer, and I realized that the patterns there on the walls were not artwork. They were names. 58,318 names listed in chronological order, the names of those American men and women who gave their lives in service to their country during the Vietnam War Memorial. I can't find the words to this day to describe to you how I felt standing there. You see, I grew up watching Walter Cronkite in the evening on the CBS Evening News. And Walter, with his grandfatherly voice, tried to explain to me, a kid, what was going on as these men and women were coming back from Vietnam. He tried to, to spin it, though it couldn't be spun. The anger, the hatred 
the, the, the vitriol that was being spewed out at these who had served our country. I didn't get it then, and I still don't get it to this day. But as I stood there in that place, in that moment, I was overwhelmed with appreciation for those men and women who were willing to do what they did on behalf of our country. I thought about that day, standing in that place, when I got to this passage of Scripture in Joshua chapter 4. It's an Old Testament passage. It's way back in the book. But it's one, I think, that is fitting for this day, for this time, in our life together. The question that was asked in the midst of this passage is, what does this mean? And so often when we see a memorial, when we see a marker on the side of a road or at a courthouse or at a, at a historic landmark, the, the question is, well, what, what does that mean? What does that stand for? If we have the time, we can read the placard. We can read what has been written about that place and that event and maybe appreciate some of what went on there, but not all of it. Here's where we were historically. Forty years had passed, and an entire nation had been, we say, wandering. Oh, they were living. They, they were carrying on life in a strange place, the wilderness of Kadesh Barnea, just across the Jordan River from their ultimate destination, but it had become that, their home for that generation. They were there purposefully because they had refused to believe that God said, you can take that land. In their doubt, they consigned themselves to 40 years of living in that place that wasn't their ultimate destination. Now, the 40 years had passed, and it was time. It was time for them to pack up their ditty bags. It was time for them to gather up their little ones, and they were going to make the move from that wilderness into Canaan, God's promised land, the land of promise. Leadership had changed. Moses wasn't going to be allowed to go into the land. Oh, he'd been able to go up on a mountain and look over and see where they were going to be living, but because of some issues that he had had, he wasn't going to be able to be a resident there. No, his second in command, Joshua, was going to be the leader that would take them into the land. God had given him some pre-instructions about what he was to do, and he had done that. He had chosen 12 representatives, one from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. He didn't know really what for at the time, and Chapter 3, verse 12 tells us that. But, but he chose those men, and they were ready to move into the land. The priests took the Ark of the Covenant. It was a sacred piece of furniture. It was a sacred box that for them reminded them of the presence of God. It represented for them God's presence with them. And they were to treat it with reverence and respect. They were to, to give it distance, but always recognize its place. So the priests loaded up the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders, and as they had been instructed, they began to make their way to the flooded Jordan River. It was that season of the year when it was out of its banks and water was everywhere in that low area. And they began to march toward it, and, and it was as God had instructed. They marched toward it, and as they picked up their feet and the soles of their feet were about to touch the water, the waters parted to the left and to the right, rolled up, were stopped, and everybody was able to walk across on dry ground, into the new home, into the new land. In chapter 4, first 10 verses, we read this, this part of the account. Now, when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them, saying, Take up for yourselves twelve stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you, and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. And that would be in Gilgal, their first campground as they moved into Canaan. So Joshua called the 12 men whom he appointed from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross again to the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. Thus the sons of Israel did as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, just as the Lord spoke to Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. And they carried them over with them to the lodging place and put them down there. Then Joshua set up twelve stones in the middle of the Jordan at the place where the feet of the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing, and they are there to this day. 
Basically, Joshua said, hey, let's, let's make a memorial. Let's, let's create something in this place that will be a reminder for those who come along beside us, and it will be a prompt for a question. What does this mean? And you will have an opportunity to tell the story again and again and again. I think for us, out of that pile of 12 rocks, there come three lessons that we can learn, along with those who were there on that day and those who've come behind them and who've come with us. Three lessons. The first one is this. Our individual experience is part of a larger story. I'll not read it to you again. Let me summarize. Twelve men chosen. Twelve men, one from each tribe. Interestingly, 12 tribes that, that represented 12 different groups of people, 12 families, if you will, large families who were traveling together. That in itself is fraught with all kinds of trouble. Anytime you travel with family, now it's risky enough when it's just you and your, your wife and your kids, but anytime you invite a brother-in-law or a sister-in-law, a cousin, an uncle, an aunt, in-laws to travel with you, you are inviting trouble. There will be disagreements. When do we stop? How long do we stay? How much should we spend? Where are we going next? I'm tired. And so the conversations go on, whether it's in the car with you or on a cell phone while you're traveling down the road or back in the day on a CB radio. Wasn't that the glorious day of the past? And by the time you get where you're going, you're so sick of each other, you're ready to go home. So imagine two million people strong, 12 large families traveling together. And now we're almost to our destination. Now we're almost there. Now there's been a little, rick, a little hiccup, a, a little ripple in the plan here because two of those tribes had, had said to Moses, we, if you'd let us, we'd like to stay on this side of the Jordan, on the wilderness side of the Jordan. Our herds are big, our flocks are big, and we're afraid that the land will not support all of them. So if you don't mind, we'd like to stay over here and let the other 10 tribes go on over. Moses considered it. There was an agreement reached. They would fight alongside the other tribes for the land, and they would make sure that the, the land that had been promised will have been taken. An agreement was made. They would be able to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Hmm. A river can get mighty wide when it's us and them. It's hard enough when it's just us, but now you've got this physical divider between us and them. And it's time to move, and we're not sure how this is going to work out. But you'll notice that when God gave Joshua instruction and Joshua followed instruction, he said to the leaders, the men from the 12 tribes, you guys go get a rock. He didn't say to 10 tribes, you guys go get your 10 rocks and bring them over here. And you two tribes, you go get your two rocks and you put them over here. As it turned out, it was nine and a half tribes and two and a half tribes as they were split between those two places but he said, you go get 12, 12 rocks, and they did, and they came back and they stacked them together. One memorial, one reminder, 12 tribes, one memorial, 12 families, one memorial. And as they would come past that memorial, no matter which tribe they were from, as they would, as they would pass by that reminder, there were those things that came back to them with, with amazing clarity amazing clarity they they were they were one people although they were divided by many differences they were one people who shared a common experience of trusting their god a god who had been with them a god who had blessed them a god who had sustained them all the way to this point the emphasis in this memorial is upon the unity of the nation every tribe now is included on equal terms and although the eventual settlement will see two and a half tribes east of the Jordan, there's never a hint that the river is to divide the nation. They are one people under their one God. Individual experience, part of a larger story. I am reminded today, our lesson, I'm reminded that we are a diverse people. I look around this room and there is some homogeneity. Yeah, there, there are many ways in which we are alike, but we are a diverse people, educationally, economically, racially, culturally. And there are many materials there for the building of walls and barriers. And if we so chose, if we focused on those differences, if we amplified those differences, we could divide ourselves. And I think at times we may have. 
We can divide ourselves along fault lines that separate us, and we could tolerate each other as we come together for worship. We could put up with each other for a time as we come together and sing the familiar songs and open the common book of grace. Yet the differences would remain, and the fellowship and the mission would suffer. But we are reminded that though we are diverse, though we are different in many ways, we are a people bound together by our common experience of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We are, we are tied together. We are brought together. We are kept together, not by our pledging allegiance to a flag, not by our pledging allegiance to a denominational philosophy. We are brought together and kept together by our common experience of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah, our faith is individual. We don't even come as families with a dad making the decision for his wife and children, with the mother making the decision for her children and husband, as it has been the case or should have been the case in some instances. We come individually, whether we are 97 or 57 or 27 or 7. We come drawn by the prompting of the Holy Spirit coming and making our public profession of faith. But even as we do, even as we acknowledge that we are lost and we, we are in need of a Savior and express our faith in Jesus Christ, even then we realize that this is not every man for himself, a lone man out on an island here expressing my faith. Our faith in Jesus Christ brings us into and makes us a part of something much bigger than we are alone. And so it is impossible, impossible to embrace the faith and abandon the church. Let that sink in. I'm perplexed and I am troubled by many who say, I love the Lord, but I hate the church. I'm saved, but I don't need the body. I think those two statements are contradictory. Not because we have created a club that we need everybody to belong to but because the church is the bride of Christ. And when we embrace Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the groom, when we say to him, I love you, and I am thankful for your salvation, and I am grateful for my life that I have found in you, when we make that declaration at the same time, by virtue of that salvation experience, we declare with our lives, I pray that, Father, not only do I love you, but I also love your bride. And I, I want to unite with you, Father, and my expression of trust in you and expression of my faith in you will be revealed as I am connected to the body of Christ and serve you through that body of Christ. Let me insert parenthetically, and these, this is not in these notes, and I, I will make it quick. These are difficult days for the church, difficult days for the Baptist church. If you've read newspapers and news articles in recent days about us as Baptists, particularly us as Southern Baptists, we're getting some bad press and it's not over yet. Southern Baptists are going to be meeting in Anaheim in a few days for our annual national convention and it's going to get worse before it gets better. We are being criticized for the way that we've held, we have handled some sexual abuse issues over the last 30 or 40 years. We are being held up for scrutiny because we have failed to support some victims and we have allowed some perpetrators to move on down the road and continue ministry, although their offenses were well documented. We have made some mistakes and we must learn from our mistakes and we must do better. And I pray and I pledge on our part, we will do better. We will do better. There is no place... In the kingdom of God, there is no place in the family of God, there is no place in the church for sexual abuse. For the perpetrators, there's no, this should not be a, an open field for you to groom and, and prey on children and, and others who are under anybody's authority. And it never should be a place where those who have been victims of abuse should be shunned and shamed because they cry out for help. I'm telling you, these are difficult days. If you haven't heard these things, you're going to hear them. But I will also tell you this. I will confess to you, the church, the body of Christ, it's always been comprised of men and women. It's always been flawed. It's never been perfect. We will, 
make more mistakes in the future. We've made them in the past. We will make, if not this flavor, another flavor, flavor in the future. But we shouldn't allow, and I want to say this carefully, and you hear me carefully. We shouldn't and we cannot allow the sins of men and women to separate us from the bride of Christ. We deal with the sins, we deal with the repercussions, and we press on together as the body of Christ. Our individual experience, y'all, is important, but we are a part of a larger story. We belong to each other. I move on to point number two. A second reality that we find in this passage of Scripture is that our story, the, the thing that, that these rocks represented for, for Israel, our story needs to be told and retold and told again. They built this pile of rocks. It wasn't impressive. There, there was no uh, plaque beside it that acknowledged the great architect who designed this. It was simple. Twelve men went out into the middle of the Jordan River. They picked up stones. I think they were significant rocks because they carried them on their shoulders. This wasn't a pile of pea gravel. These were pretty good-sized rocks. And they all got themselves a rock. And if they were typical men, they were each trying to outdo the other. And so one of them, the first one, saw the first guy pick up one rock. And the next 11 rocks were bigger than the last guy before them. So they're all probably struggling under the load of their particular stone. They bring them over to the side of the river Jordan and they place them together. And Joshua said, here's what God told me. Every time you pass this way, every time Google Maps brings you this route on your vacation, every, every time you decide to stop here and, and use the rest area down the road, every time you stop here and go to the Stuckey's next door and get your pecan log, and your kids get out and they're wandering around, walking the dog and whatever, and they pass this pile of rocks, your kids are going to ask you, what does this mean? And I want you to tell them. I want you to tell them. What were they going to tell? Well, the story was a, it was a great story. They were going to, they were going to remind their children that, that this was a place where God was with them. How do you know God was with you? Well, I just know because I, I either saw it or my grandparents saw it or my great grandparents saw it. We were, we were, they were all gathered there on the banks of the Jordan river and those priests picked up that ark and there's a little story there. That ark represented the presence of God. It wasn't just an ordinary box. It represented for them God's presence with them. And he wanted them to treat it with, uh, with sanctity, with respect, and they did. And they could talk about how the priest carried that ark out into the middle of the Jordan River on dry ground. And they stood there as all those hundreds of thousands, even millions of people walked across from the wilderness of Kadesh Barnea into that place called Canaan. God was with them. But not only was God with them, it reminded them as well that God had protected them. You see, they'd all been to that place before the Jordan River, particularly at that time of the year, swelled beyond its banks and covered a great deal of, of land. Oh, there were other times during the dry season when it was smaller and not as impressive, but at this season it was fairly foreboding, intimidating, and they were wondering, how are we going to get from here to there? There's no bridge there's no, there's no group of Corps of Engineer folks to construct a pontoon bridge. How are we going to get across? And they watched with interest and fear what's about to happen. The priest picked up the Ark of the Covenant and they put it on their shoulders and they started marching toward the water. Foolish faith. <laughs> what's going to happen? Don't know. Let's wait and watch and see. The guys in front picked up their foot and as the sole of their feet touched the surface of the water, it parted. As the sole of their feet touched the surface of the water, the water backed up this way and that way and they were able to walk across on dry ground. Miracle. No doubt a miracle. Because I'm telling you, we had a rain. What day this week did we have a rain? That Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, one of those days. We got, I got a, over two inches of rain at my house. It came through my backyard. Natural drain that goes down to Lake Tankersley. A whole bunch of it came through my backyard. It was wide running across there. And, and I'm telling you, it was a sight to behold. I was glad to see it. And it finally went away, and it usually does, a few hours after the rain stops. But it takes about a week for my backyard to get dry enough for me to be able to walk in and mow after that fact. In moments, 
after the waters parted, the children of Israel, a couple of million strong, walked across on dry ground. A miracle of God. And so they could tell one another, you know, I, I was there and God was with us. I know he was because the ark was there and I could just sense his presence. And, and God did something that we couldn't have done ourselves. God was there in our midst. God was in our presence. And they'd finish up their story, perhaps. You know, it wasn't just about taking a trip. It wasn't just about getting over a river. It was about getting from and to. We were leaving a lot of things behind us. There were a lot of difficult memories back in that wilderness. There were a lot of cemeteries back there, a lot of people who had died because of a, of a season of not believing God. And they'd suffered the consequences. It wasn't that they were afflicted with a horrible pox. It wasn't that they, that they died from starvation. It was simply that they settled for less than what God designed for them. And that season of life was over with, and, and, and that, that succession of funerals had ended, and now it was time to move forward into Canaan. We call it the promised land, the land of promise. And, and it, it was a beautiful land, and, and it was bountiful in that land, but it was the land of promise because it was the place where God said, I want you here. Follow me. I want you here. Trust me. I want you here. And that was part of their story. Our story has to be told and retold again and again and again. Again, We've got a story to tell, a story about God's love that we've experienced in Jesus Christ. A story about our sin and our spiritual death. A story about our salvation. A story about our, our being set apart for a particular purpose. A story about our being here for a reason. I mentioned earlier that these are, are difficult days in certain quarters. These are difficult days for the church because we are being, gosh, attacked, assaulted by a culture that hates God. Uh, they want life on their terms. The culture wants life on their terms. And when we say the Bible says, man, that just fires them up. They are ready to, to go to blows. And, and our temptation is to back off into a corner, dim the lights, and talk more softly. Let's not offend them. Let's keep this to ourselves. But it's the truth, I know, but let's keep it to ourselves. We don't want to offend anybody. Listen, I, I don't want to be just purposefully obnoxious and offensive. That, that's not in my DNA. Some of you, it's in your DNA. You work at it. But for most folk, no, I, you know, I'm not trying to tick people off. And we shouldn't be picking a fight. We shouldn't be looking for some person out there with whom we want to engage in a, in a battle of wits and a battle of words and, and see if we can't bully them back into their corner. That's not who we are. We are the people of God. But never should we back off into a corner, dim the lights, pull down the shades, and quietly share our story. We need to be willing to go into the town square, into the line of the grocery store, into the marketplace, and tell our story. What is our story? Not that we're angry. And we hate this person and that person and this group and that group. Our story is, let me tell you, I am who I am because God loved me. Oh, really? Yeah. But you, you think you're all that because you're a member of that church. No, 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 no. I think I am who I am because God loved me. But you haven't been through what I've been through. No, I haven't. But I've been through some stuff. Let me tell you, I've got my stuff. And God had every reason not to love me, but he found me, and he loved me nevertheless. And because he loved me, he saved me, and he gave me a new beginning and a new way of life. It wasn't me saying to God, I'll accept your salvation, but on my terms. No, it doesn't work that way. We accept his salvation on his terms. We give ourselves to his life and be willing to follow him. That's part and parcel of that salvation. And so we can talk about that. We can talk about what God has done in our lives. You can talk about where you've been and what you've been through. You can talk about the mistakes that you've made and the scars that you have. You can talk about that, not glorifying them, but simply stating the case. I am where I am, and I am who I am by the grace of God and because God has a plan for my life. And furthermore, if God can do it in my life, he can do it in yours. That brings me to point number three, the winding up part. And y'all just thought... Y'all thought I was going to preach a short sermon, but I got five minutes to my regular stopping time. <laughs> Point number three, our reflection of the past should propel us into the future. God's purpose in this remembrance was much more comprehensive than nostalgia 
or reminiscence. Both of those are good. It's good to tell those old stories and to pull out the old photographs and remember when and do you remember when we and you remember how we used to that that's not a bad thing and and that was a part of this no doubt but God knew what lay ahead it wasn't just about looking in the rearview mirror he knew what was coming down the road he knew their covenant relationship would be thoroughly tested he knew they would be exposed to other gods they were going to see some things and hear some things that were going to rock their worlds They were going to have to make choices that they never anticipated that they would have to be making. And he wanted them to be reminded in that particular moment of where they had been and where they were going. Where they had been, where they were going. That's what those rocks point you to. Memorials have to do more than elicit warm fuzzies. We've got two. They're not piles of rocks, but we've got two memorials that we perpetuate. We call them baptism and the Lord's Supper. Every time we we share those in worship, they prompt us to remember what the Lord has done for us. We look back and are reminded of His love for us and His sacrifice for us and, and the way that He has saved us. We are reminded of those things in those memorials but even as we are reminded of those things, we, we are reminded of how he has changed us and how he has given us life and is giving us life. And our faith works in this day for this life. We're being tested and we're going to be challenged even more. And we're going to have to reach down deep And find again that motivation to carry on. Some of you are going to find yourself in a place where you're going to question your connection to the church. Some of you are going to find yourself in conversations, if not with your children, maybe your grandchildren, maybe a neighbor or a co-worker, where they're going to ask you some hard questions. And the easy thing to do is going to be able to walk, is to be willing to walk away from the conversation and not engage them. We can't. We mustn't. Because God isn't done. And He's working in the church and through the church to accomplish His purpose. Reaching out to those who are not believers, who are lost, and drawing them to a knowledge of who Jesus is. Walking with them as they grow in their faith and they continue to become who God has created them to be pointing them to God's word, a word that is an unchanging word. And I I will never apologize for the word of God. And you hear me say this often, and I want you to hear it again and again. It isn't that I worship this book. I do not. I refuse to be guilty of bibliolatry. But I will forever worship the God who is revealed in this book. And I will revere this book because it is the revelation of God His revelation to us, and we will hold on to it and hold it up. And we will remind ourselves, this is a thousand-year-old story, a pile of rocks in a very old place, but an old story, a truth that at times seems antiquated, is relevant for this very day and for this very hour. And we will encourage one another and walk with one another and share the good news of who Christ is and what he's up to in our world. What does this mean? Be ready to answer that question. What does this mean? Tell your version of that story. What does this mean? Be willing to allow that conversation to be a help to somebody who's in a bad place, trying to find a better place. Pray with me. Father, we thank you. It's amazing how you took something as simple as a pile of 12 rocks and turned it into a very powerful message. I I pray that, if not the stones, at least the story will keep communicating in this day. Father, if he or she is sitting here this morning and they have realized, I need Jesus. Yeah, I need church. I need religion. I need community. I need accountability. I need all those things. But before I need any of those things, I need Jesus. And I pray for his, for her salvation for their willingness to trust you with everything that they have and everything that they are. And God, I'm convinced 
that Satan has done a number on some and he's either drawn them away from your bride, the church, or he has soured their perspective on the church. And my prayer, Lord, is that we can continue to be that people of God together. We can continue to serve you together in a way that will invite and welcome those who need your family, your body, to stand up, to stand with us, to be a part of us because of you, Father, because of what you've done. So I pray that you will bless us in this invitation. In Christ's name we pray.